All right, welcome back to the Orthodox Ethos and our Tuesday night lecture. Tonight we're going to be talking about the great saint of our age, one of the great saints of our age, Saint Pais was the Athenite again, but we're going to talk tonight about his great virtue of reverence or evlavia in Greek. We'll talk a lot about the virtues and what we need to, how we need to imitate and follow after Saint Pais. So tonight, the aroma of reverence, the piety, and the uh, the virtue of Saint Paisios. Let's go right into it with our prayers, and uh, we'll come right back and start the lecture as as usual. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of the gospel teaching. Implant us also fear of thy blessed commandments to trample down all kind of desires. We may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things well pleasing unto thee. Without the illumination of our souls and bodies with Christ our God, unto thee we ascribe glory, together with the Father, from the last holy good and life, creating spirit, will now endeavor unto ages of ages. Amen. Evlogito si Christe o te o Simon o Pansofus tu salis anadixas kata pemsas aftis to pneuma to aigi the afton tiniku meni saigi nemsas philanthrope doxasi Amen So one of the great mysteries of today's orthodoxy and one of the great criteria to understand if someone is making progress, is sincere, and on the path of repentance, is how much they've obtained and they have experience of a deep reverence, a deep reverence, which is so much a part of the Orthodox ethos. We talk about the Orthodox ethos all the time, acquiring the Orthodox ethos how that uh, these things are inseparable from dogma. If you fall away from the ethos, you fall away from the dogma. And vice versa, if you fall away from the dogma, you can't acquire and make progress in, in the, with the ethos. And the ethos is the way of Christ, and the dogma is the truth of Christ, and these things are inseparable. But when we go to the saints' lives, especially this volume, uh, which I hope some of you have, right? This is the older version the new version let me show you the cover of the new version this is the first version that came out years ago um the life of saint Pius has been reissued and this is the cover right here saint Pius of manathos after he was glorified and accepted into the roles of saints of the church that's the book you want to get if you don't have it all right and uh by the way one, by far, this icon is by far the most uh, beloved, I think, or at least the most beloved by the disciples of of uh, of Saint Paisos in Greece. To my knowledge, the one they use uh, not only in the life uh, that we published in English, but also um, in uh, the circles there around Manathos. Um, before I, I, I should have made a, an announcement before we get any further. So tonight we're talking about obviously this topic, the Orthodox ethos of St. Paisius the Athenite. But tomorrow night, for all of you who are interested, we'll be talking about this topic. Can unity be attained by decontextualizing history? Chetty, Alexandra, and the postmodernist Nociology. This is going to be a, a deeply theological uh, and interesting analysis of the contemporary dialogue between orthodoxy and catholicism 
we're going to be talking about the importance of context. You can't have a you can't have a decontextualized understanding of history and the and church uh, church history and theology. And what happens is it leads to essentially the loss of repentance. And this is what's trying to be avoided essentially in today's dialogue is that we don't need to repent. No one needs to repent. And it, what it does is it leads to a relativism with regard to, to dogma. And that's tomorrow night uh, right here in Orthodox Ethos. There'll be live streaming here as well to Crowdcast and to Orthodox Ethos and on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and all the other, uh, the two Facebook pages. Uh, and so that's going to be uh, a, a very interesting discussion with our friend Craig Patrick Trulia. He'll be joining us and uh, helping us and analyze uh, the, these, this not only the texts from Alexandria. We're going to talk more about that topic of how we can see, uh, you know, seemingly a, a lot of reversals on one level in the theological dialogue and yet no repentance in terms of basic dogma. So we have all kinds of, uh, you know, admitting historical and theological uh, errors and lies and fabrications. And, and yet we don't have any progress toward true repentance from the dogmas. And when the dogmas we're all going to be, are going to be kept. Uh, there's not going to be any repentance of the dogmas. That's, that's what we'll discuss tomorrow night. So if you want to join us tomorrow night, five o'clock. So that's the announcement I forgot to make at the beginning of tonight. I think those who are inclined toward the love of truth and the whole question of the of the very um, talked about 2025 meeting of the Pope with at least the Patriarch of Constantinople in Nicaea, that's uh, coming up. That'll be uh, an important uh, discussion. Prepare ourselves for those for those days. Um, very good, Olivia. Glad you joined us. So the book is also being, oh, it's good, it's being distributed by Jordanville. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's also distributed by St. Nectarius Monastery, the, the new version of this book. Uh, it, you can get from the distrib distributor of St. Nectarius Monastery also. Yeah, there you go, Justin. So uh, if you don't have the book, I highly, highly recommend you get it, you read it, you study it. It's a catechism in many ways for us. And, you know, the big thing we're missing here in America, let's be let's be frank, we don't have a lot of examples. We don't have, we don't grow up with examples, most of us. And if, without examples, it's very hard to acquire some of these virtues, uh, especially the um, filotimo, uh, you know, the whole, uh, the whole, let's say, uh, uh, constellation of virtues that we see in St. Paisios, uh, from obedience to humility, uh, the worker and preacher of repentance, the uh, lack of any desire for acquiring goods, the, the non-possessiveness, uh, the, the philotimo, as we said earlier, the, the great trust and faith in God. And then also uh, tonight we'll talk about his love uh, and his understanding of reverence or evlavia. Before we get into that, we have to say a few words about the difference between evlavia or reverence as we translated it in this life with uh, what we usually are using in English, which is uh, a translation of obsevia. There's, there's, you could translate it different ways, actually. It's, it's pretty fluid. But we translated evlavia as reverence and obsevia, very close. These words are very close to one another in meaning, if not identical. And obsevia as piety. And because we have this phenomenon of pietism, which is very well felt among many Protestants, and 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 uh, heterodox and of course orthodox can fall into that trap as well, and that's a excessive focusing on the externals, uh, and 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 it's essentially uh, a kind of um, delusion and arrogance that is hidden underneath you know going through externals and motions and making um, I mean the distortion of piety. Pietism is a distortion of piety. It's not connected to dogma. It's not. It's not rooted in a deep spiritual life. Uh, so, uh, so we chose to to translate Evlavia as reverence, which he reveres. Somebody who has Evlavia has great love and great um, spiritual sensitivity. We'll talk about what Evlavia is in a minute. Reverence, 
And then we chose uh, Evsevia to translate as piety because it's closer to the, to the distortion, uh, pietism in, uh, in English. Uh, so those are not the same. Like we have to make very clear, we're not, uh, we're not, um, we have to be very careful not to fall into that trap, right? And that's a trap usually on the right. In other words, a zeal not according to knowledge, uh, a delusion that people think if they pour on more externals, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing more, appearing more pious, you know, the Pharisaism essentially, if that's, if they pour that on, then they're going to be understood to be closer to God and they're going to do what's right. They're going to be a good Christian and all the rest. It's, 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 a, it's a, actually a sign of the loss of the grace of God. It's very tragic. It's, one, it's very hard for people to get out of that, just as it is. And all the temptations on the right are much harder, to, if you fall into them, to get out of them. To, to, uh, that the zeal not according to knowledge is harder to, to heal many times than... than the extreme, um, you know, giving over to the flesh. So the Lord says, neither hot nor cold, or hot, either hot nor cold, but not lukewarm, hot nor cold. Um, otherwise, I spit you out of my mouth. So uh, there's, you know, the various temptations in the left and right. Uh, they have different obstacles which are presented for them to come back to a healthy, humble authentic spiritual life there's just constant challenges to that so we have we need we have need of great uh examples and that's why we're sitting here talking to you tonight about on the, on the on the eve of the feast of the new calendar uh although i think it's the same actually in the old and new for the most part in greece uh and around the world most people are celebrating the feast of saint Patrick's tomorrow uh on the old calendar we have of course saints peter and paul many years to all of you who are celebrating the feast of saint peter and paul uh, on the old calendar, and and um, uh, so I think in Mount Athos, the solution, there's a variety of solutions what they do because he fell asleep on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul. Uh, others go back two weeks. Others uh, just move it a day. Um, I, I've seen a different solutions for when they're going to celebrate on the church calendar the feast of Saint Paisios uh, on Mount Athos. Um, they've for whatever reason, not chosen one solution. But in any case, here we are on the feast, on the eve of the feast on the new calendar. We're going to talk about St. Paisus. And, you know, we wanted to do that because it's a good continuation from our whole uh, ana analysis of the Jesus prayer, which was often, uh, which was also based in referencing the teaching of St. Paisus. So let's talk about this reverence, what it's all about. Uh, and, uh, we see in the life of St. Paisios that he grew up with a great example, as many, many saints have, and that is the example of his own mother. And his own mother was, for him, a great, great example, a, a, a rare example of reverence or piety. Many people refer to it as piety. We're, we're again, re redefining it to make sure we don't fall into the misunderstanding of this, which is pietism. So we're calling it reverence, but essentially it's piety. We do say we do say in the in the divine liturgy, "O oh Lord, save the pious." So we do use the term in a very positive way. So it's not a problem to use it in a pious way, in a positive way. Uh, pious piety or piousness or someone who's pious that's fine, but just to make sure we're not confusing the two, we we translate it as reverence. So. He had his mother, and this is a tremendous, tremendous thing. And many of us who are converts of the faith, and many of us who even grew up in the faith, maybe we're just the only person who's struggling to be an Orthodox Christian in our family, or we're just one of few, uh, and people don't understand. Uh, uh, many of don't understand. We have actually Orthodox Christians in the church who don't understand piety, right? They're very secularized. They don't understand the things I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So we're we're all in tremendous need of going deeper on what it means to be pious. So from a, from the child from his own childhood, he grows up with a great example of sobriety and piety and and and, and love in his own mother. And then he also finds fairly quickly when he goes to Mount Athos a higher monk who he describes later on as as a great example for him of reverence of reverent piety. And he talks about what that image is. What is that image of piety? 
He would say, we can't reach the, the reverence that he had. We can't reach the, light, the height of piety that he had. It's impossible. He would celebrate liturgy every day. And he struggled greatly. He was a great struggler, a great ascetic. Once, for half a year, he ate nothing but half, uh, nothing but half of a small prosphoron. For half a year, he ate nothing but half of a small prosphora and a few tomatoes dried in the sun. Now, I don't know if he meant for six months, that's all he ate, or for for every day. It's, a, it's not clear to me. Uh, but in any case, that would be a tremendous struggle uh, for most of us. It would be an amazing struggle to eat just a small prosphora and a tomato each day. And it, it looks like it's more than that, though. So... This great higher monk, which is a great example for St. Paisos, he would serve out in the chapels and St. Paisos would go and chant for him. And that was that was a uh, something he would do for a lot of the priests because he loved, loved going to the chapels and, and chanting for the priests. The elder had a, a, an innate, innate desire, innate inclination uh, to, to reverence and piety, but he also cultivated it. So this is something that's important for us to, to learn that uh, it has to be, no matter what gifts or what examples one has in their life, they have to cultivate piety, reverence. They have to cultivate it on a daily basis. You have to work at it. You have to force yourself. You have to ask God for it. You have to beg God for deeper piety, reverence, and, and fear of God. What is, let's try to define what, what reverence is, right? It's going to the elder is the greatest virtue because it attracts the grace of God. Now, that's an interesting definition. We, we hear in other, in the Yerodikom, we hear that discernment is the greatest virtue. And it is, actually, you can say that both are the greatest virtue. Why? Because discernment is the fruit of a very reverent life. Uh, so you can say maybe on the hierarchy of things, it's the, it's the, it's the virtue that's the hardest to obtain and the, most, uh, the, the one that shows forth that the person had made the most progress. But... On the other hand, if you have no reverence, no piety, no love uh, of God and fear of God, then you're, of course, not going to make any progress. Uh, and so in that sense, it's the greatest and most important foundationally for the Christian. Uh, he says reverence, essentially, reverence was the fear of God, or is the fear of God and spiritual sensitivity. It's the fear of God and spiritual sensitivity. Uh, so write that down. You're taking notes tonight. You should be taking notes, uh, especially if you don't have the book that I'm, I'm going from the book. Uh, and if you have the book, you can crack it open and follow along with me. But if you don't have the book, you should definitely take notes. So write that down. Basic pillars of somebody who is a reverent, pious person before God is someone who has the fear of God and is spiritually sensitive. You can't be totally insensitive and, and, and indifferent to the spiritual life and to the spiritual reality and have reverence. And people who are reverent, who are pious, have uh, behave carefully. They do not, they do not, they're not reckless. They don't, they don't have idle talk and go around and do things foolishly. And they don't, uh, they don't become a center of attention. And all these things are not characteristic of a reverent person. The person who's reverent is standing and feeling themselves always in the presence of God. Another pillar of what it means to be reverent. You feel yourself in the presence of God. If you're in the if you feel yourself in the presence of God, you're not going to act like an idiot. You're not going to act like a fool. You're not going to crack jokes continually. You're not going to waste your time. You're not going to speak idly. You're going to think on and pray and be before God. You're going to you're going to your mind is going to rotate around that feeling of the presence of God. And you're going to be checked in many ways from going to extremes or going uh, far from uh, this remembrance of God. So one who behaves carefully and one who behaves modestly. This is one of the virtues that's most missing in our society is modesty. But it's also one of the things that's most misunderstood. As I've said in other lectures on St. Paisus and other things I've talked about, what, how do we understand properly the Orthodox understanding of modesty? It's not just or not even primarily a question of externals. It's not a question of, uh, well, they, they have all their body covered. A modest person will do that. 
But that's not modesty necessarily. That's just covering your body. Now, modesty is much more than that. And in Greek, the term is semnotita. Semnos anthropos is somebody who's not just externally covering themselves. That would be a total emptying of the the spiritual virtue of modesty, right? So the fact that we kind of have that, a lot of people have that in their mind as modest, that's because they've emptied it out of meaning and they're left with the externals. And that's kind of a that's kind of a fruit of or an example of pietism. The fact that we have to talk to people, how do you go and stand in church? Don't go to church in shorts and a, and a, and a T-shirt. Don't go to church in a miniskirt. Don't go to church with your you know women having their half of their chest. I mean, these things are so basic, so obvious, you know, so self-evident that the fact that we have to say it means the person is totally clueless as to what it means to be modest, right? These things are a given. We shouldn't have to discuss them. That was the way it has been for thousands of years. People covered themselves in public if they had any sense of spiritual life and spiritual sense about them. They covered themselves in humility, just why the same reason why a woman covers her head. Or for that matter, a monk covers his head as he walks through the streets and they have kukuli, they have a a veil over them in in the in monks and nuns in the church. All of that is a kind of protection, physical uh, reflection of their spiritual internal life. That is that they're focused, they're not distracted, they're not they're they're closed off to the things of flesh. They're not trying to focus on their flesh. They're not trying to get people to focus on their flesh. So the fact that you would cover yourself. It was so basic, so, uh, you know, self-evident. And then what do we see in the Gospels is those people who weren't covered, what were they? What were they? Who were they? What were they? They were in the tombs and they were possessed. We go to the, the just yesterday, what, we, last week we had on the new calendar, they had the Garganese, the the the, uh, the possessed ones, and the, the Christ freed, and the demons went into the, into the pigs, right? Those were the kinds of people who were half naked or naked the ones who were possessed. So that just tells you where we're at spiritually in the world today, right? So modesty, when when they say here that he behaved carefully and modestly, that doesn't mean he covered himself in a cassock. That's just, it's just like, of course he did. Like, that's not, we're not talking about it. So modesty is a deep spiritual, uh, it's a virtue of how we comport ourselves, we carry ourselves, uh, and we think of ourselves, and we and we and we behave in front of other people. We have, we're, we're deferential to the others. We're self uh, uh, de- de- deprecating in many ways. We don't, we don't even, you know, even better. We don't even talk about ourselves or think about ourselves, and and we com- carry ourselves with, uh, with uh, without wanting to uh, make, let's say, an impression on people, or wanting to impose on people, or wanting to. Uh, to tr- distract people, we want to we want to be in their presence as as a as a as a a presence of God in their presence, which is peace, which is humility, which is simplicity. Right? That's all connected to modesty. Uh, it's very it's all interconnected. You know, humility, uh, meekness, modesty. Uh, these things are intertwined. Right? They're kind of just different sides of the same stance uh before god that somebody who lives in the presence of god and that's really i think the way you would describe a saint and saint paisus is no different so hopefully that helps you to understand that you can't have true reverence true piety if you also are not making progress in all the virtues that's why we said it and we'll say many times uh again this is page uh 414 414 the Roma of Reverence in the uh, the first first edition. I don't know if the page numbers have changed in the second edition. I don't have the second edition, Timothy. So uh, the, the, the constellation of virtues, remember how we said the virtues are not acquired piecemeal, but in fact, they're brought with the presence of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit brings them. They cannot ultimately be chopped up and autonomized. The virtues are a part and parcel of the life in the spirit. So one who is making progress in constantly being in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit dwelling and never leaving is is has there with him in him 
all of the virtues. And of course, there's going to be a struggle to constantly and, and more perfectly be in harmony with those and to express those. Right? But essentially, the spirit of God is what brings all the virtues. He is, it's him crying out within us, his presence that is uh is 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 the pres is the uh, conveyor and the uh, the uh the expressor of all the virtues so these things are come with the spirit of god all right so but we what we're, we're describing now what it means to be a reverent person that's why we're reading this today we want to be like saint paisius we want to make progress in this and we want to uh have this in our life as the apple of our eye and we live constantly in this, in the presence of God, and, and reverently and piously uh, conducting ourselves. John says a new convert used to dress inappropriately. I noticed, I noted this to him. He said, "Well, God sees us naked." I said, "But God, does God want us to see you or each other naked?" Well, indeed, indeed. But you know, even more than that, John, if you read Saint Isaac the Syrian, he'll say that this, the ascetics. They don't want to see themselves naked. They take great pains to make sure they don't see themselves naked. They don't want to even put that in their head. So, uh, you know, that's very interesting. Uh, there's also a famous story. I don't think this has ever been printed anywhere. St. Porphyrios was talking to one of the future abbesses in one of the monasteries in America. And he, of course, saw things, right? He saw like he had a, like a television. He just saw right into and he called this uh, this spiritual daughter of hers, his up, and they happened to be, I think, in Constantinople at the time, and 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 it was the middle of the night, and so the first thing he says was, "Go put some clothes on. I don't want to see you in your pajamas." <laughs> so there you go. Think about that now. If the saint, if the saint is so much modesty, he doesn't want to look upon his spiritual daughter in her pajamas because he can. So that's just a mind-boggling, right? For us, we're so lax in everything in our life and in our world today. We're so at the other extreme. So we need a hard right correction on the question of piety and modesty and reverence. But there is a danger. There is a danger for all of us because we're very legalistic and pietistic and moralistic. That's how we've been trained and raised in this heterodox world, that we're going to make a mess of this attempt to become reverent. We're going to become super hyper uh, mindful. We're going to be super hyper legalistic and, uh, and and super correct. Don't do that. That is that is a dead end and you're going to you're not going to make progress. So be careful, like be yourself. This is one of the things that I'm going to next. Now, a, a modest, reverent person does it in an unaffected way. And it's internal. It's not external. It's not mental. It's an internal reality that just flows, right? It's a part of his inner life. Uh, it has to be unaffected, all right? You cannot make it up. You cannot put it on. You cannot You cannot act reverent. It doesn't work. It's, it's, a, it's a giveaway if anybody has any criteria. So unaffectedness cannot work, right? So... <clears throat> I'm sorry to hear that, John. John says that convert and his son returned to his clown church, the, the, the papal Protestants, after three or four years. That's a tragedy. We see that, and that's I guess that's unfortunately going to be the case. There's a lot of people who, who are not being properly catechized, they're not being properly initiated, and they're being prepped to leave the church eventually, which is a tragedy. It's a great, great tragedy. Where I talk, and I need to talk more and more and more about proper catechism, proper initiation, proper training, proper, you know, uh, guidance. This is what's so important for all of us, but how much more for the converts so they do not fall away? Because once you become Orthodox, you have a, you have a bullseye on your back, right? And if you're not prepared to do spiritual warfare, you will, you will be uh, in, in, in grave danger. So this is one of the great disservices of an of a improper or, or very impar uh, partial uh, catechism is that we do not prepare people and then we actually set them up for failure, which is a tragedy, tragedy. So we must not focus on external forms, but we have to focus on uh, the internal 
man and that person being honest, integral, have integrity, and, and what we do coming from within. So Elder, Fra- Elder Paisu says, you know, good order is good. It's good to have order in the church. But disorder is not a good thing. But it has to be from within. It has to be because there's an order within us. If there's disorder within us and we're imposing order externally, it doesn't work. It's not impressive. It's not a virtue. And people sense that. Uh, in the midst of all this, there has to be still maintained freedom. Freedom is, is, is there when you see that the person is genuine. He's simple. He's humble. He's, he's down to earth, as they say, down to earth, right? In other words, they keep low to the ground and they're humble and they're simple. And that's a sign that there's still spiritual freedom going on. It's not a fakery. And when we have fakery and when we have put-ons and shows, that's actually when there's a tyranny, right? There's not freedom. There's not a true freedom from the passions, but we're, we're under the weight of the passion of pride and, and, and arrogance. So um, the elder would say when we have a fake, uh, when we have true piety, true reverence, he says it's like, that's like incense. And when we have a fake or, or distorted piety, a pietism, that's like perfume, right? That's like perfume. Uh, so again, this distinction between evlavia and evsevia, or reverence and a piety or pietism. And um, it's, you know, we make, again, one of the reasons why we made this distinction in the translation is because in modern Greek parlance or, or, or usage, evsevia is, is sometimes or more and more often it has a negative connotation. And it, and it, um, it's it's again synonymous with a formalism, all right. So, again, uh, just making that distinction, right? So we're not talking about a pietism here. We're not talking about externals. We're not talking about, uh, you know, putting on uh, uh, something to make people feel, you know, oh wow, he's so pious. So you know, that's there is this. You see this, and it's really tragic. I saw it in the village. There would be older ladies who would show up in church and they would make big crosses and big prostrations and big, you know, show of piety. But you either knew from confession or you knew from friends or something that they didn't understand what it meant to be an Orthodox Christian on a daily basis. They didn't have much of a prayer rule. They ended up uh, going and doing worldly things. And so they, they were in delusion, essentially. I mean, we're all to a certain degree in delusion when we don't walk the narrow path. And we, but, I mean, this was tr- a tragic kind of double life that people lead, right? And they end up in, uh, I don't know what's worse. You come to church, you know, let's say a woman comes to church and she's putting on a mini skirt and she's got makeup and she's trying to make an impression on people and she has jewelry and all this and her hair is like, and all of this kind of thing, which is a tragedy because it's just, I mean, what can you say about that? It's just, yeah. I mean, I don't know what's worse, that or a fake, super external formal pietism, which is graceless. It's graceless, right? And it's not. And and how do they get out of that? How do they get out of that? Um, it's hard to. It's hard to know. Um, um, which is worse sometimes. Um. <clears throat> Well, I guess I guess the first is worse because the first actually scandalizes a lot of people and brings them to a worldly life, whereas the second could could be passed off as piety. So that's probably in the order of things that's worse. The elder also focused on which is, and stressed, which is of course from the gospel itself, is that you have to do both the little and the great, right? So he'd focus on the little things uh, because if you don't get the little things down, then you're go- you're in danger. Of, uh, of falling away without realizing it, right? And saying, well, this doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, this doesn't matter, hey, it doesn't matter. And this, you see this in, you see this in America in the, in the following way on a, on a mass scale, and that is this distinction between big T and small T tradition. Have you heard this? Now, some of it's legitimate, but most of it's not. And most of it is writing off uh, uh, important uh, ascetical practices, or, or, or piety that's been handed down, uh, you know, reverence has been handed down in the church, 
Uh, you'll see, you'll hear some of the stuff that, that in this chapter here, which people write off as just superstition. The elder was very committed to the very great details about his piety and his reverence, rather. And so there is this idea, well, small T tradition, you know, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you do this. Like, wait a minute. Those are the holy things. We don't do things like that with the holies. We don't give, you know, the holy things to those who are not initiated or whatever. There's many examples we can talk about. But that is, I think, a, sometimes an expression of this, well, the small things don't matter, just the big things, right? What, and then you see this also on a, on a we're going to talk about this tomorrow night, actually, a dumbing down and a, a, a limiting of what's really important to only doctrinal decisions in, in the ecumenical councils. That's the only thing that's non-negotiable, right? Everything else is uh, whatever. It's fallible and it can be changed and we change it. And that is wrong. That is so wrong. Because the holy tradition is, is a unity and it's passed down. It's like a father. You know, if you, you re, if you revere your father, you revere everything he gives to you, right? And all the small traditions in the family and what he... And the wisdom that he gives you, you don't just say, well, my father was this and he believed in these big picture issues. But otherwise, I really don't, you know, I don't pay attention to what he gave me or what he taught me or the traditions, traditions he passed down from his grandfather. It is an all it's an all encompassing you organic whole, the holy tradition. So you see these various this is a sign of the dissolution, right? When you see theologians saying only these narrow four doctrines matter otherwise we can just all get along right that's it that's the humanist approach to things sometimes or you see people doing the same thing with holy tradition uh and tradition in the parishes like they're just cutting it down to the most you know limited things well what is really to be a christian is just to love your neighbor well, of course you have to love your neighbor. Yes, of course. This is the one of the you know, greatest commandment, and then the one is like unto it. Yes, but that's not it. The, the Lord didn't say, and this is it. Everything else I'm going to teach you, all the rest, not so important. He never said anything like that. He said it's all important. Everything's important, right? We're on page 415, Nicole. 415. So when do we, the expression of this reverence of the saint and of all the saints comes through throughout his whole life, but you would see it most notably when he prayed, of course, when he venerated the icons, when he was receiving on Dithron, anything that had to do with the holy things, holy water, partook of holy communion, when he went on processions, held icons, when he chanted, when he... Uh, uh, you know, he would uh, uh, clean or take care of his chapel, arrange his house. All of these things would be, an, of course, an expression of piety or, or reverence, right? He had a great attention to details. He didn't say it doesn't matter. He would align the, you know, everything had a reason and a point. He, 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 he would put everything in an order and he would have a reason for it. It wasn't just like willy-nilly, right? Uh and it wasn't it wasn't also uh strictly uh just oh i'm going to whatever the tipicon says and i'm just, i'm just going to be lax otherwise he in his great love would create his own little tipicon in a sense right his own personal disposition would would manifest itself in particular ways so he would he would make his whole hermitage his whole house and 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 surroundings he would treat it like a chapel he would see. He saw it as sacred. His house was sacred. Do we do that? Do we try to keep our house in order and make it a place? Everything a place of uh, reflecting uh, piety and reverence. And uh, uh, do are we careful with all of our icons? Are we careful with our incense? Are we careful with when we use things and we burn things? Do we put them in the in the burn trash that you know the the holy trash as they say? You know that's going to be disposed either in the church or, or, or burned and then buried or buried or whatever it is that we're doing. There's various traditions, the way to, you know, proper way to dispose of holy things. What are we doing? All of that is a way to show our love and fear of God. It's all, it all matters, right? I mean, you can be, of course, everything can be done in a distorted way. Doesn't mean the things are, are bad in and of themselves. 
Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's characteristic of St. Paisus, but also many other saints like St. Seraphim of Seraph, is that he basically treated his bed. I mean, St. Seraphim actually put a, a coffin in his, in his house. He slept in the coffin as a bed. But uh, he would treat his bed that, so it was like a coffin to remind him of the repose that's coming soon, right? We're all leaving this world. Some of us will live long lives like St. Porfirios like, or, uh, or, or St. Sophroni, who on the new calendar was celebrated today, or St. Ephraim, Elder Ephraim, who lived into his 80s. Or what am I saying? Was it in his 90s? I always forget. Was it 85 or 90? Anyway, I'm losing it. Uh, and so he was constantly with the remembrance uh, uh, of death. He would also use the censer often, right? He would sense every day, all his house and everything, right? And he had the candles there, lit, lit the candles, lit the, uh, the oil lamps. And he... Um, <clears throat> He would not, he would always treat the icons with the greatest respect. He wouldn't put them on the ground. This reminds me that I have an icon on the ground over here that I, I put there temporarily and forgot. So there you go. It reminds me I'm not being pious. And the um, he wouldn't put it on the ground. He would be very careful with the icons. And there was one icon that was faded, that was, that was, uh, it was uh, kind of beat up, and somebody asked him, "Was it? Why is this icon beat up?" And he didn't. He didn't really want to say. It. And then eventually, he said, "Yeah, basically, I can't get through an entire vigil, uh, but by weeping and kissing this icon." So the icon was uh, over the years became very, um, you know, tattered because of his tears and his kissing. So that shows his great reverence and, and love of God. Um, but there was other things in his hermitage, which he treated again as a sacred place that showed his reverence. He had a place where he made little icons, the guest house where people were brought and he basically reborn them by the grace of God, his balcony, his yard. He thought it irreverent to have a toilet in his cell, in his hermitage. So he had one way out in the corner where he would have to go to the restroom, of course. That is the case also, by the way, I remember at the Hermitage of Elder Isaac and Elder Ephemios in Kapsala, who wrote this book, his disciples. They also had an outhouse, very, very primitive, and that's where they used the restroom. So that was far away from the chapel, far away from their living quarters. So he, he saw that, very interestingly, as something he didn't want around, because he didn't want, I guess... I mean, I'm just, I'm sure there's some explanation he would give us, but my, my guess is that, that the, you know, going through those motions, perhaps you, you are in, you're exposed, your body's exposed. I don't know. I'm just guessing. And these are things that are not consistent with prayer. And so he wants that removed from that, that he doesn't want to think about that. He doesn't want to talk about that. He doesn't want that to be next to anything. He wants it very segregated so that there's no, you know, when you go do that, you go do that, you're done and you come back and there's no thought of it. I mean, so people are on the noetic realm, right? They're in the noetic realm. They're not legalistic or external. They're looking at noetically. How do I maintain focus and, and, and piety throughout the day? You see churches now built where you walk into the exonarthics and there's toilets right there. And, I, you know, I mean, I don't think people even think about this in America. I don't I, I don't think I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not upset or anything. I'm just saying it's very interesting how different his perception was as is the vast majority, if not 95% of the um, Orthodox in America. And uh, he did this again for ascetic reasons, but also mainly because he was uh, concerned about this reverence, right? Being constantly in, uh, the proper stance before the holy things and didn't want that to be in any way impinged. So put that far away from the holy things. And he treated his house. And, and of course, the chapel that he prayed in on a daily basis was in his house. So he didn't want 
the outhouse to be anywhere near that. Um, when he was sick, his disciples built a outhouse and attached or wanted to build. Oh no, they he did. They did build when he was um, he was at the Holy Cross. That was before he went to Panaguda. Because I went to Panaguda, I don't. I never saw an outhouse. So that was the previous uh, Kili. And he was sick, and they built it, and they put it right outside the house, right like attached to the house, and he never used it. So now he has an outhouse in the middle of the night. It's freezing outside, right? And he's got to go to the restroom or something. He doesn't go there. He goes to the end of the uh, the property, and he never used it to sh- because he did not he did not do damage to his conscience. This is another thing that you can't make progress in true reverence if you are constantly trampling upon your conscience or justifying your laziness and your slothfulness and your arrogance and your pride and all the rest of the things we do, right? We justify ourselves. Oh, I'm going to eat that. I'm really hungry. I like that. I want to eat that, right? And just go, you just follow the desire. Now, somebody say, well, Father Peter, that's extreme. I'm just telling you how I understand the saints working, okay? You, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm not saying we're in the position to do it or whatever. But I'm saying this is how I think I understand the saints living. They, 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 they were constantly vigilant over their thoughts and their conscience. It was, was the most important thing. Do not violate the conscience because that is the that is the voice of God. So you're 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 turning away from the will of God when you violate uh, your conscience. He characterized. He said when they built that outhouse there, he said, "I cannot use that because that's where the Panagia appeared." He saw the Mother of God. He had a vision of the Mother of God. It was in that spot near the house, uh, and he said, "I cannot do that. How can I go?" there where I saw the mother of God. So, I mean, obviously that's something quite exceptional, but it shows you uh, how close he was to God and how these things permeated his life, right? That's where the mother, I saw the mother of God there. St. Defimia came to me there. This is the kind of life that the great ascetic lived. Um, He reacted to the holy things as if they were alive. Isn't that interesting? I love that phrase right there. Think about that a minute. How often do we treat things that are dead as if they're alive and we almost bow down to them? Think about things you love, things that are filled with no spirit. I mean, the spirit of God is not in them. Things of this world, music, food, clothing, right? We treat them and we with great reverence because we love them. We like, we want to have more of them. We go out, we hug them. Oh, I love this shirt. I love this food. I love this book, right? And these things are dead, essentially, right? Now, they they, have, they communicate something to us of life, but they're really not eternal life, right? So how often do we treat those things that are dead as alive, and then we treat the things that are truly alive with the Spirit of God, the holy things, as if they're eh, just a part of creation? There's no... We don't understand them as the presence of God in our life. So the holy the holy things, the lives of the saints, the prosphora, all the things that are offered and made holy, the prosphora, the articlesia, the koliva, right? The things we offer and are blessed by the church, the holy water. How do we how do we treat these things? Do we treat them with the utmost respect? Or are we are we negligent? Oh, oh, I just spilled that whole holy water down on the ground. Oh, let me pick it up. Oh, we'll just burn that. I'm guilty, right? When you are a priest, you have the grave temptation to become numb to the holy things because you're constantly around them. That's why it's a very difficult thing to be a priest in any age, but how much more today? How much more today when everything is just essentially... um, carnal if not i mean if not carnal it's at least like common right we treat them as common things so a sign of great progress in reverence is that the holy things are of great importance and you treat them with great respect there was one time when he was visiting the hermitage of another monk and he had a problem with his hernia, and the monk said, come on, you know, lay down, take a rest. And he would not lay down and take a rest. 
because he would have to do it on his side, his left side. And if he had done that, his feet would have been pointing out on the bench or wherever he was towards some icons. And he thought that would be irreverent. So he said, if I lay down there and my feet are pointed at those icons right there, because that's where your couch is or whatever, then I feel like I'm being irreverent. I can't, I can't have that stance before the holy things. I think there is a danger for all of us very immature people who, that we are, let's be honest, is that we're going to take that and become very legalistic with it. Be careful. Right? He didn't, he wasn't legalistic. He wasn't like some, you know, some like paranoia, you know, mania in his mind or something, imagining things. This is not how it is. It's very, very natural. You, he sees the mother of God. He sees Saint Ephemia. He sees, you know, saints. He understands the presence. He lives the presence of God. So this is not some kind of, you know, superstitious thing, which it, I think it can be for us if we're not making progress in great humility and prayer. So we need to always remember this. These things are good. These examples are fun, uh, wonderful. How we implement them in our life is another matter. How are we able to? Are we mature? Are we prayerful that we can implement these great examples of piety in our life? That's the question. Before entering the holy altar, he would make a full prostration to the ground, and he would receive it, re remove his monastic cap, and he would kiss the cross on the altar curtain. Of course, he wasn't a priest, so he didn't kiss the holy altar. And then he would enter by the side door. Right, so he would make the prostration outside the holy altar before the uh, the door. He would enter kiss the uh, cross on the curtain because they would have curtains and not doors on the iconocets for the way to get in and out. And he would, uh, he would then enter. During Holy Communion, John, you're absolutely right. The myriad of seemingly small compromises we make in accommodating our modern life have worn me out, he says. Yeah, it's it's it can be it can be very taxing, but we we'll just get back up on the saddle, get in that saddle again, and keep going. During the Holy Communion, the hymn uh, at the liturgy of the Communion hymn, if he intended to commune, if he was planning on communing, he would make full prostrations. I think here he was referring to when they go to the icons and venerate before Holy Communion. For a time, he had as a rule to eat nothing for 33 hours before communion. He would eat nothing for all of Saturday. Let's see, he was going to commune on Sunday. Let's say on Athos, they're communion at 7 in the morning, maybe. It's 8 in the morning, max. You know, if they're starting at 3. So what is that? He would go the previous day, Saturday. So basically, he would he would fast from Friday night. Because of his great reverence for the mystery of the priesthood, he refused to be ordained. He had opportunities. He had several opportunities. And he says characteristically, Christ gives the gifts, but do we have to accept them all? So he had three opportunities, he says, to be ordained. He refused to be ordained out of the great reverence he had to priesthood. You know, as a priest, I hear that. I wonder, you know, just how obtuse I am and how perhaps I'm just blind. Maybe I, I have no idea what, I, what I'm doing. You know, I mean, you think about that. I mean, if St. Paisios, out of the fear of God and love of God, refused ordination, what what am I doing? You know, that that definitely is very humbling and um you know god help us by your prayers the elder saw reverence as a fundamental virtue for every christian every christian must necessarily be if he's a true christian a reverent pious modest prayerful human being right and even though he considered it essential for every christian he said it was rare in our day And even though it's rare, he still considered it the greatest of the virtues. 
We talk about the sermon is the greatest, we said earlier, but in, different, in a different way. He would use reverence as a criterion. And he would talk about someone's reverence. And if someone was criticized for something, he would say, but he's a very pious man, and he would justify him. So if he saw somebody as being very reverent, very pious, right? Gregory says, you might be blind, Father, but you see more than many. And yet, when I left Mount Athos, you know what my elder told me, Gregory? Never forget, you are a one-eyed man in the land of blind people. And that one eye, of course, was the experience of those elders, right? They gave me that one-eyed vision. And so just because you got, I mean, the criteria of everything is so skewed today. So we should never, ever think we're anything. We're never anything. We're all poor paupers compared to the saints. Uh, so he had this as a criterion, and he would say, well, the person's pious, so he must it must not be like that, right? So it's just, he couldn't, if someone had reverence, piety, humility, love, uh, in the context of the things of holy, the holy things and of God, then it was almost as if that person uh, should, should receive the total benefit of the doubt, right? By the way, now this is just me talking, this is not Elder Paisios or any of the saints, I think that, um, well, I just, I can't say any specifics. I don't want to photograph anybody or talk about any, anybody by name, but I'll just say the following. And anybody, who, whatever you understand, absolutely confirmed in my life that, absolutely confirmed in my life is that the dogma, when it's departed, brings in its wake a loss of the ethos. And when you go at the people who've departed from the dogma and have fallen into heresy or delusion or teaching innovations, you do not find reverence, great and, and, and all filled reverence. It's one of the keys you can experientially understand. Is this person on, is this person orthodox? Is this person, oh, in the true sense, the full sense of the word orthodox, right? In in the, the they have the mind of Christ. They're they're cultivating the mind of Christ, and they're orthodox, and and they're struggling to go deeper in the in the meanings and the uh, of all of the holy things and of the of life in Christ. And so, therefore, if you so when you it's so interesting in my experiences that when you go to certain places and they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, they are innovating and they are following heretical teachings. The spirit of the world is there. Reverence is not to be found. And I'll just say, I'll just give an example of one Athenite monk who came to me. Um, and he, and he, um, thank you, John H. That's true. All that's true, what you wrote. Uh, absolutely. God and the Panagia just tolerate us now uh, in these, uh, these days, according to St. Paisius. Um, so uh, one one higher monk came to me year, years ago and, and sat down and said, I want to tell you some things. And anyway, he told me a lot of very interesting things that were just really eye-opening for me about the state of the church. And it was very interesting. The, the people in the place that he talked about, which was really egregiously in, prob you know, in trouble dogmatically, what, the way he described their spiritual state and what they want was that they, there's no reverence. There was no no desire for God. There was no no piety. So he would say to them, "Let's pray," and they would be like, "Oh, we got too much work to do." Uh, and they would cut the services down, and they would uh, they, they instead of six psalms, they do three psalms, and uh, this the vespers would be really short, and and so you know, clear signs or confirmation that they're you know that the dogma had, had departed. Now they. The ethos is, the reverence is gone. So I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, just from my little pithy experience, that the criterion, it is a criterion. Reverence, piety is a criterion in order to understand and judge and, and, and understand what's going on in the church today. So if you see great piety, you almost always will have, I mean, not pietism, not externals. I'm talking about true reverence 
fear of God, prayer, you will have somebody who's, they, they might not be dogmatic professors, they might not be anti-heretical warriors, they're orthodox though. And you can be a hundred percent sure they're orthodox, and you you it's 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 they're inseparable. It's so true in practice. All right, so he would give the benefit of the doubt to anybody who was reverent, and the elder believed that this quality of reverence preserved a person from making errors, from deceptions, and from falling. That's very very interesting. What, basically, what I just said, right, from the verse reverse. Uh, and he says this is uh, they, they liken this to Proverbs 2 8, where it says, The Lord will carefully guard the way of those who reverence him, who have Evlavia, who have love and reverence for him, right? So, uh, it affected everything, it affects everything, and it raises one to a lo- the life in the spirit. It's the, it's the, you know this because you know that it cannot happen without true synergy of man and God. There cannot be spiritual progress. It, it, we are not Calvinists. We do not have anything imparted without our full participation and love. Nothing is imparted against our will or in spite of us or in, indifferent to us. It is, it, it is presupposed that we have a good disposition, a loving, struggling disposition. Uh, so there you go. It is. Uh, it affects everything, right? It acts as a steady factor in one's life. It it is. Uh, it raises them to the spiritual plane. He would advise monks to take care to acquire reverence. He would say a new monk, especially, has to be reverent, has to be pious in the in the good sense, right? Through and through, it helps for him to always have the ever to get the nos. The ever get the nose open and to spend time with other monks who are reverent. You guys know what the ever get the nose is, right? Do I need to point them out again? So English, there's four volumes in English. Now, <clears throat> so the ever get the nose is a four volume in English anyway uh, collection. There's three of them here. It's a collection of the sayings of the fathers, the desert fathers in Egypt and Palestine, mostly Palestine, and, um, well, both, actually. And and their antidotes and their stories, and they focus on the acquisition of virtue, whereas the Philokalia is a collection of writings that focuses more on the noetic prayer, right? So, but... We're in grave need of the Evergetinos, right? We need it. That's why he's a young monk, right? He's going to be reading and always have the Evergetinos open, right? He's going to have it in front of him. And every day, a little bit, just a little bit. As they said about St. Isaac's, you know, St. Isaac's. uh, Let me see here. Everybody, how many of you have? How many of you have the set of homilies of St. Isaac? Huh? Anybody here have the, the set of homilies of, of St. Isaac, the Syrian? So what, what does it say here? From one, of our, 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 one of the great elders of, the, of our day, listen to what he says. Same thing applies to the ever to get the nos. All right, same thing applies to the ever to get the nos. Elder Joseph the Hesychus and the Elder Euronymus, both of them talk a lot about St. Isaac. But again, the same thing I think applies to the Evergetinos, especially for us. More so the Evergetinos to us than to uh than to the St. Isaac. I mean, we're we're not we're not uh Anachorites, right? We're not uh, you you have Marie has the new version. Yeah. This is the uh this is the older version. This is the 1990s version. You have the new version that they've made uh, changes to. I mean, it's fine, but it's a different uh, uh, look. We, we're not uh, hermits, right? We're not anywhere near the level of St. Isaac, right? We can learn a tremendous amount. We should be reading them. I'm just saying, in comparison, we should be reading everybody at the nose. If all the writings of the other fathers which teach us concerning watchfulness and prayer were lost and the writings of Ava, Isaac, the Syrian alone survived, they would suffice to teach one from beginning to end concerning the life of stillness and prayer. 
They are the Alpha and Omega of the life of watchfulness and interior prayer, and alone suffice to guide one from his first steps to perfection. That's talking about the noetic prayer and watchfulness and everything. So apply that now to the, to the acquisition of virtues and how important that is for us who are still babes. I would say that we could say something similar about the ever to get the nose. And then I like a lot what El Deuteronomo says. Forsake not Isaac. Every day, one page of Ava Isaac, Abba Isaac, right? One page, not more. <laughs> Elder Yeronimos of Aegina, not more. Isaac is the mirror. Isaac is the mirror. I love that. That's so. That's great. That's how it is with all the saints, but Isaac is even. There you will behold yourself. The mirror is so that we may see if we have any shortcoming, any smudge on our face in order to remove it, to cleanse ourselves. If there was a smudge on your face or on your eyes in the mirror, you will detect it and will remove it. In Avaisak, you will behold your thoughts. What are they are thinking? Your feet, where they are going. Your eyes, if they are have light and see. There you will find many sure and unerring ways in order to be helped. One page of Isaac a day. One page. In the morning or at night, whenever whenever it is, suffice it that you read a page. You know why he said that? Because he knew most people wouldn't even do that, right? They would be struggling to do that because that, that means you're mindful every day. Oh, 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 I'm not going to bed or I'm not going to move away from my prayer rule. I'm not going to start my day without sitting down and reading a Isaac. Now, that is true for everybody. We could definitely do that. All right, it's tremendously helpful, and and of course it applies to everyone. It's not. It's it, it's contrary to what a lot of these, that a lot of our friends today say. Well, no, this is for the monastics. No, it's not. It's for everybody. Having said that, it applies even more, I think, to the ever get the nose. But that's just my opinion, and that you can do both. Do both. It's even better. All right. So. Getting back to what he says, he says, a new monk especially has to be reverent through and through. It helps him to always have the ever to get the nose open and to spend time with other monks who are reverent. All right, so this is something that we have to really struggle to do today. Now, if you're if you're in, I don't know where, you don't, you know, you're surrounded by people who don't even believe in God or have no reverence for God all day long, that's gonna wear on you. Right? You've got to then double down. And say, now that I'm free of those bad examples or those indifferent people, what am I going to do with my free time? Where am I going to spend it? I need to be around reverence, piety, love. Right? Run to reverence. Examples of reverence. Now, you might say, I don't have anybody in my life that's really that reverent. Well, then run to the lives of the saints. Run to the videos even on YouTube that are all about the lives of the saints. There's a video right now from a number of sources, Russian and other sources, and Trisagian prayers all about the life of St. Paisios. Fill your life with the saints. If you want to imitate them, you want to have you got to have them as examples, you got to put them in front of you. That's really key, right? And and I gotta tell you, I've recognized over the years that I've become lax. It's so easy to become lax. There's so many distractions, right? Good things, good things. I'm not going to do bad things. God, God forbid, I hope not. I'm trying to do good things in my life, but they are not necessarily the one thing needful, right? So we can really become distracted. So we've got to have examples in front of us. We've got to have the saints. We've got to have read the Ever Get the Nos, the homilies, ascetic homilies, etc. There was a Russian bishop who came and presented a, a several candidates to the priesthood and asked the elder, which one should I ordain? Or what is the criteria for ordination? And the elder said to him, those who are reverent and pure, reverent and pure. So if we think about that, what is the the enemy uh, doing most to ruin us, ruin the church, ruin the world, ruin the, the, the strength of the church. What's he doing? Corruption from the youngest age, corrupt them, impurities, right? And 
impiety, blasphemy. That's what you see. He's pouring down as much as many people as he can to get to do those two things because the opposite is what the Lord wants. The opposite is what's necessary for the priesthood and therefore really for everybody. That's what our goals are, right? The elder did not say bright, educated men with PhDs or masters or even undergraduate degrees. He didn't say that, did he? He said, what do you say? Purity and reverence, piety, love of, of virtue, love of prayer. Uh, he didn't say we need a bunch of activists. He didn't say we need a bunch of uh, good speakers, good homilists. It's not what he said. That's not the criteria of the priesthood. Everybody who knows, knows, but there are a lot of people who don't understand that. Oh, we need we need to have a good speaker. We need to have priests with, you know, external things. You know, the externals is what's important. So let's hear what he has to say about chanting and iconography and about reverence and true piety in these things. He would say, if you pay attention to the meaning of a tripartian, it will change you. And you'll be able to chant in a reverent way. All right. So he didn't say the reverent way is just to perfect it. To become really good at the chanting method or art. He said the reverent way is when you enter into the meaning. You feel it. You love it. You love the meaning. And that meaning has a mystical way of changing you. Why do you think we're living in the age of nihilism? It's the exact opposite. They've lost all meaning, and, mean, and meaninglessness permeates our uh, our society. It's what Father Seraphim Rose says. If you, you have to admit that you're breathing in the pestilence of the age, which is nihilism, which is meaninglessness. It's the exact inversion of what Christ brought. He brought the meaning of all created things. He, told, he enlightened uh, the people of God to understand that everything that was created, what the meaning of them is. Right. First and foremost, God in our own life, but even more so, even after that, we come to understand the meaning and purpose of creation. And that's why when the saints and the ascetics use creation properly, do you do you think there would ever be? I'm not saying there is, but you think there would ever be a a, a ecological crisis or a lot ecological destruction if the people were ascetics, if the people were pious? Never. There would never be such a thing. Civilization itself would never have been developed as it has. Civilization is not inspiration of God, by the way. You, you do know that. I hope you understand that. This is Cain. We're living in the age of Cain, not Abel. This is the Tower of Babel. This is industrialization, all the rest going on for 200 years, is building utopia. This is the opposite of the ascetic struggle, the ascetic life, the simplicity of the ascetic. So they enter into the meaning, and this is one of the things that breaks my heart and has broken my heart for 30 years as an Orthodox Christian, is that you and I, the average Joe Schmo Orthodox guy who's, or girl who's trying to go deeper, either we don't understand the language Although that's less and less. I've been Orthodox 30 years. It was, believe me, it was 30 years ago. It was a lot different. Although it's not, in some ways it hasn't changed much, but it's definitely a lot more going on 30 years later in terms of Orthodox mission in the English language. But that's not the, that's one problem. The other big problem is they don't even chant them. How many places do you go and you don't hear the canon chanted? In English. How many Parishes, and apparently this is an OCA practice. I don't understand it. And there's good people doing it. So I'm not judging anyone here. I just don't understand the practice. There'll be Vespers on Saturday night, but no Orthros on Sunday. Or no Vigil on Saturday nights. And they just stand, they just end with Vespers. That's painful. How are we doing that? I'm sure there's the inertia, maybe practices, but I don't know. I don't know. There's even pious. I love some of the people doing it. I don't understand. So what's going on with that? Why is there no orthros? That's the, the orthros is the service where the most theology, most meaning is given. And here he says, if you pay attention to the meaning of a troparian, 
it will change you. How are we going to be changed if we're not even chanting the Traparian, let alone hearing it? <laughs> so what does that mean? You need to go and get the services. You need to go buy the Menean. I know it's a it's a, it's a lot to a lot of work to be Orthodox today. You got to be very deliberate. Like, you know how they, there's intentional communities now? I've been talking about this with my coworkers. There's a phenomenon in the last 25 years. That's blown, I think it's blown up more and more. Not hugely, but there is a lot more people doing this. I, there's a some very trad, trad uh, papal Protestants who are, you know, moving all together in some place in Kansas, St. Mary's in Kansas, and they're trying to live together. I, you know, I, I applaud them. You know, they're trying to live simple Christian lives, unfortunately, in total heresy and delusion, but uh, they're still very well uh, motivated and impressive. So we have intentional communities. We have to be intentional about our own catechism. We were not properly catechized. 99% of us tonight here were never properly catechized. And so we have an uphill battle to do it our own. We've got to take it in our own hands. So if you're going to enter into the meaning of the Traparian, like he says here, and go deeper into reverence and have it change you, then you've got to get to know the hymnography of the church. You've got to take it in your hands and read it. So Timothy says, and OCA even wrote an article about the OCA published uh, an article the OCA published about having no matins. Does that mean that's good? They were like celebrating it or they were saying, what are we doing? Why don't we have matins? Yes, Elizabeth, orthros and matins are the same thing. Just different languages. Orthros is Greek, matins is from the Latin. Uh, uh, Timothy, what does it mean? Does it mean that they saying that it's justified or are they saying we got to stop this practice just curious thank you justin for the link to the atlantic that's a that's about these uh trad uh papal protestants in uh, kansas who are getting together and doing intentional community oh it's a question they were saying a question like what's going on here why don't we do maddens so that's a pretty widespread practice in the oca timothy like most parishes don't have maddens it's like an exception for a vigil on Saturday night in an OCA parish. Is that accurate? I don't want to misrepresent things. Nancy in Alberta. The Traparian is one hymn. It's the Traparian usually is, is usually referring to the, the dismissal hymn or the apolitikion of the saint, which is the main hymn. But there are many Traparia, right? There are many hymns. So if you pick up the services, you start to study them, you'll see that there are many little hymns. There's odes, and, the, and each ode has four, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so uh, it's made up of many hymns. So they're talking about probably the saints talking about the main Traparian, I guess, of, this, of the feast. All right. Um, looking forward to hearing that. Uh, Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's not a given in the OCA that they're going to not do Maddens. It just is uh, something that's, maybe is it from the Uniates that converted and never did Maddens? Or where is that coming from, I wonder? In my experience, Timothy says, no Maddens. Wow. Our priest who became rector five years ago started doing Maddens every other Thursday. Every other Thursday? Okay. But not on the weekends. Is that just because people just won't accept it? Like they've just grown used to it? All right. Yeah, you got to study it, Nancy. You got to sit and get the books and go ask in church and say, I want to learn the services. Can I see the Manan? The Manan is the service book with all the lives, the services of the saints. Start with the Manan, I think. But you can start with all the different ser service books. You can start with the Octoicos, which is the eight tones that circulates throughout the year. You can start with the Pentecostalian, which is the 50 days of Pentecost. There's many books with many hymns, many services. 
The OC Cathedral near me has vigil on Saturday evening. So there are some cathedrals. Maybe it's a cathedral thing. I, I remember in San Francisco, I think they had vigil at the OC Cathedral. Yeah. The Minan. Can somebody spell the Minan for our brothers and sisters here? So I don't have to write that. Usually it's M-E-N-A-I-O-N. They just transliterated it from the Greek. And that is basically the collection of the services to the saints of the church. All right. I need to get back to the text and keep going here. Um, so if you, I'm going to say it a fourth time, I think, or third. If you pay attention to the meaning of the Troparian, it will change you according to St. Pius here. And you'll be able to chant in a reverent way. If you're reverent, you might make a mistake while you chant, but it'll come out sounding sweet. If you only pay attention to technique, I mean going note by note without a reverent spirit, then you'll end up like a lay chanter I once heard. He was chanting, bless the Lord of my soul, like a blacksmith striking an anvil. <laughs> That's funny. I heard it in a car and it disturbed me. And I said to the driver, please take that off. When someone doesn't chant from the heart, it's like running you out of the church. Let me repeat that. When someone doesn't chant from the heart, it's like they're running you out of church. How true is that? We've been there. There's a sacred canon. Do you believe this? People don't even know about cans anymore. It's such a shame. People don't pay it. They're not trained. To, they're told not to read the canons today. Canons are extremely instructive. All right. You know, you don't mean you go apply all the canons, but you need to know them. It's good to know them with sobriety and humility and to, and to you know, talk to your spiritual father about them. But it's not, it's a good thing to know the canons. He says, a sacred canon says that people who chant with improper voices should be given penances because they drive people away from the church. Wow. Think about that, huh? Hey, you over there, you don't know how to chant. That's a penance. You won't commune for the next six weeks. What would he say? I don't know. We can't. People aren't getting penances for serious sexual sins that are really destructive of the spiritual life. I don't think we're going to be giving penances to poor chanters. We can't even get some chanters sometimes. But it shows you how much they wanted beauty and proper order and piety and reverence in the church. Right? Okay, now about iconography. The, the saint says the following. You should make an icon with reverence. Notice how he didn't say photocopy it. You should make a, an icon with reverence, like we're going to be giving it to Christ himself. So all of you iconographers out there, you're giving the icon to Christ himself. How would we like it if someone gave us a photograph where our face wasn't right? It was all distorted or something. It's not right for the Panagia to be depicted like St. Anna, right? The Panagia is not St. Anna. St. Anna is St. Anna. Panagia is Panagia. I mean, not to show her physical beauty. He says, the mother of God, the Panagia, was the most beautiful person in the world in soul and body that has ever been. She was the most beautiful person that's ever been in soul and body. How she transformed people's souls with her grace. That's the mother of God. So you cannot play with that. It's very important you have great reverence. Only a reverent soul and mind can paint icons properly. The Despina asks, where can we get a copy of the canons? You, it's good you asked, because St. Anthony's Monastery has been working, along with some of our people in Uncom Mountain Press, one of our chief uh, persons in, part, in charge of our publishing, has been helping to get the pedalion ready for publication. That is the canons, uh, the, the, the collection of canons. And it's been a very long process, but we hope, we hope in the next six months, It'll be out. We'll see. It's, who knows? These things take a long time. When he was talking about the icon of the Mother of God of Philotheo Monastery, St. Paisios, who loved that icon, said it's not perfect icon. It's not a perfect, you know, uh, uh, execution. 
but it has such grace and such sweetness, he says. And this is what he says. It's probably because God rewarded the iconographer's reverence. So reverent souls, even if they don't have the perfect execution, they make the most beautiful icons, the sweetest icons, the grace-filled icons. So far more than a skill of execution is the piety, the love, the reverence that you're taking to what you're doing. The grace of God, said the elder, comes to reverent people and makes the soul beautiful. Synergy, right? And it co- Where does the grace of God come? To reverent people. People who are reverent, pious, love service, love prayer. That's where the grace of God comes. People say, I'm struggling. God doesn't want me. God doesn't like me. I, don't, can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't. Yeah, but what are we doing in terms of love of God? What are we doing in terms of prayer? What are we doing in terms of reverence and piety? We, many, many times people think it's God's fault that I don't have grace and I don't make progress. John H., that is a, that might well be the rudder, but you have to be very careful with that addition. It's got a lot of errors and a lot of commentary, which is not St. Nicodemus's commentary, just so you know. So if you go and, and read the, the Pedalion as it is now, it's not a proper and faithful translation of the Greek, just so you know. You get the basic structure, but don't, you're going to have to second guess when you see things weird, right? And go back, find somebody who knows Greek. The elder says, if a person's not reverent, if he scorns divine things, then the divine grace abandons him. And he's overcome by temptations and becomes like the demons. Divine grace won't come to an irreverent person. It comes to people who honor it, honor the the Lord, the grace of God, that is. The elder considered it irreverent to place icons, ecclesiastical books, on didron and holy objects in general on the seats of church stalls. Right, the stasidia we call, like they have a manathos. He says, you don't put icons, you don't put books, you don't put antidoron, you don't put holy objects on the seats in the church. Interesting, huh? And even more so on chairs or beds, except on a pillow, he said. Interesting. So on a pillow, it's okay, but not on a bed, not on a chair. See how unique it is? It's like incarnated in him and his own perception. Uh, that is all out of piety, and of course, God accepted it all even if you and I might not have that kind of exact rule, right? That's It's it's coming out of a pious, reverent heart. I mean, we can certainly imitate him, but I'm just saying it's not going to all be the same. Like, not every saint's going to have exact same take on everything. He suggested that people put the little icons that he would hand out in their pocket chest. Listen to this now. This is kind of frightening. He says, once a pilgrim came to him, holding his head crooked from neck pain. Through divine enlightenment, the elder realized that the man had suffered this at the hands of demonic powers because he had put a cross the elder had given him, which contained a piece of the precious cross of our Lord in his back pocket. He suffered this this, this, this chronic problem with his neck from demonic activity. Because he put the cross with a piece of the true cross of our Lord, the actual cross from Jerusalem, in his back pocket. All right, so everybody, pay attention. Treat the holy things with great reverence. Be careful. Be careful. As if you have God himself in front of you. How do you treat the holy things? We all need to be more attentive. We're very lax. We're very lax. The elder forbid anyone who lived carelessly to carry the precious cross. There was a cross that would go in procession. He would be very careful who he gave the holy cross to. He once told us about someone who had become possessed because he had spit in an uneven and unclean place on the day when he had communed. He communed 
he went out and he spit someplace which was unclean, probably in, I don't know, a toilet or I don't know, God knows. And he became possessed by the demons. The same happened to a woman who had thrown holy water into excrement. She got possessed by the demons. Another time he related a young man who was a, engaged to be married, visited a conjurer. Conjurer is a sorcerer, right? Somebody who does sorcery. He visited the sorcerer who told him to urinate on the wedding rings. What idiot is going to urinate on his wedding rings? I mean, what, whatever. Like, this guy's deluded. Poor guy. He followed the, the instructions and the man became possessed because wedding rings are holy. So he disdained the holiness of the wedding ring, which, of course, symbolizes and, rec- and the, the, the sacredness of the marriage, the, the, the mystery of of unity in Christ. That's what that is, right? So by following the sorcerer, who obviously was out to get him possessed, I mean, that's what sorcerers do. They lead you down the path of following the demons. He listened to that. He did obedience. That's a big part of why it happened to him, the possession, because he was obedient to that, which is contrary to God. It's not the externals. It's also the internal spiritual disposition that he had, which was not proper and not God-fearing and not reverent, and he became possessed. All right, just three examples. The elder had many more. What happens when you're not reverent? One of the things that he really didn't like and I really don't like, and this is something that I can't stand in academia, He doesn't like when the Holy Fathers of the Church are referred to first by their first names. Basil, Gregory, John. No, 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 it's Saint Basil. It's our Holy Father among the saints, Basil the Great of Caesarea in Cappadocia. No, no, Basil. This is, I don't know if you guys read academic literature from theologians. Total impiety as far as I'm concerned. Oh, no, no, this is what we do, academia. You don't put saint. It's because it's demonic. You're demonically inspired and deluded. What do you mean you don't put saint? You're an Orthodox Christian. Who cares if you're an academic? What does this mean? Why do you do that? And there might be very good and well-intended people who do this. You're deluded. Stop it. You. Why would you refer to the saints without the proper respect and the title that the church has given to them? The elder said. We talk about father so-and-so and and say father to monks and clergy. And then we go and say to the Holy Fathers, Basil, John, Gregory. What? Ah, It's one of my biggest pet peeves. I hate it. And I hope to God that that never happens. I never am part of that. We got to be careful. This is a good thing for Justin and John and Timothy. Be careful. We never produce anything like that. Academic texts from our press or anything have to be according to the Holy Fathers and not according to academia. He didn't want people to offer God candles made from impure or artificial beeswax. All right. So the the, the fake petroleum stuff that burns and blackens the churches. He didn't want that. He didn't take them. He didn't accept them. Pure beeswax, pure beeswax, and only pure beeswax, all right? So this is a wake-up call to all of us. I'm sure we have used all kinds of it. Now, at least in church, but I would think the elder would say, don't even use it in the house. I use it. We have those little things. What are they called? The little votive things. We buy them. I don't know why we do that. Probably stupid. We shouldn't do it. I mean, we don't really use them as in church, obviously. We don't use them in church. Only beeswax in church. We have them, you know, in in the table over there and we might put even put them to light a, you know a better lighting for compline or something but now i'm reading this and i'm reminded of what how, what a stickler he was i don't think he would use those in any way so there you go it's always good to reread you know come back and get woken up again fill their lamps with olive oil he says Not of olive oil of poor quality, he's, but he wanted olive oil of the best quality. He says we offer our best to, in worship. I think that I'm guilty of that too. 
I, I go and I buy the, you know, tons of olive oil, but I don't really pay attention if it's the highest quality, pure virgin olive oil. I get olive oil. I mean, I think I get pretty good olive oil, but I'm not like, oh yeah, I need the best olive oil to offer. I, I probably, I think, what do you think? What do you guys do? Do you drink, do you eat a lot of olive oil? First of all, if you're a Mediterranean Greek, you do. And what are you doing? You, you're putting the best of all olive oil on your salad, aren't you? Pure virgin, right? But then you're putting in the oil lamps. What are you putting? Lord have mercy. We should offer up our best efforts, our pure prayer, not our yawning. Now that's a way of saying that all, all things we offer should be pure and blessed, right? <clears throat> he considered it greatly irreverent to use prosphora for the liturgy that was tainted with mold. So if you got prosphora and it gets moldy, no, 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 no. Don't use it for divine liturgy. Don't offer it in the church. Don't use it if you're a priest. Christ gives us his body and blood, and we give him moldy prosphora. He would walk miles to find prosphora for the divine liturgy, and when he carried it, he would hold it by the side, taking care not to touch the seal. So he was an ascetic, right? He was in the middle of nowhere sometimes in Sinai or in different parts of Athos. So to get prosphora, he didn't have any way to cook prosphora, so he would have to walk, and then he would have to go to like a monastery or another cell or something, maybe up to Borazeri or down to Stavonokita, and he would have to get the prosphora, and when he walked back, he would never touch the seal. He wouldn't want to touch the seal, right, because that's the part that's cut out and becomes the amnos, the body and blood of Christ. Prosphora, Nancy. Prosphora is the offering of the bread, which becomes the body and blood of Christ. It's the it's the baked bread, which is a particular way, and it has stamp on it, and very, it's very much a, done by those who are pure, women who are not engaged, in, obviously, in any kind of impurities. And generally, it's, they prefer women who are not sexually active. The, so older ladies usually are offering the prosphora. And, and that's just the you know, expression of the piety of the people that's come down to us. I don't think it's some kind of legalistic thing, but it is de definitely kept in the monasteries. Uh, and so, you know, you're offering the best, you're going to be in a position to offer that. So that's, that's consistent with what we're listening to here right now from the elder. <clears throat> the elder tried to show gratitude and be pleasing to the one whom he loved. So this is a summary and then we'll open up for questions. You guys, you guys got your questions ready? Out of his great love, he offered to God the very best. Out of his great love, he offered to God the very best. And he conducted himself with refinement. That's in Greek, that's leptotita, leptotita, right? Refinement. So he had a refined and, and, and sensitive soul. And everything he offered, he, he made sure it was the best, right? That with, with spiritual sensitivity, with reverence, this is what he wanted to offer to God. And God, being pleased, bestowed his grace on the elder in abundance. So in Greek, it's leptotita evestesia evlavia, or refinement, spiritual sensitivity, and reverence. These are the things that the elder of Themios and elder of Sak, um, how they're describing his his great aroma of reverence, right? The great fragrance of piety. Certainly, men can make prosphora Jacob because the whole, the monasteries make prosphora. All the monasteries have those who make prosphora, so certainly men can make prosphora. I used to make prosphora. I mean, not me, but I would go and watch the monks at considerable time. I'll make prosphora. Who else is going to make it at the men's, men's monastery? Where they going to go out? You can't go out, go out and get women to make it. 
All right, that is the uh, that's the sharing tonight. Hopefully, it was beneficial for you all. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful chap chapter. I really have uh, focused on that uh, in the past a few times. I think it's really important for us. We need it so much. We have this crassness, this secularism, this coldness that we've inherited from the Protestant milieu. It comes into our churches. You go to your churches, you feel like you're at a Protestant service sometimes, even though it's all done Orthodox wise. The spirit is not that reverent piety. And, and in, the, in Greek, the word is katanikotita, which is a uh, katanexi. It's like this, you know, feeling of piety and reverence and, and compunction and contrition. That's missing in a lot of our parishes. It's missing in our lives because we're surrounded by this coldness, iconoclastic, you know, uh, environment. So we've got to struggle very much on our own to um, get to the point where we're sensitive to all this so we can make progress spiritually. First question I have is from Hilarion. I don't think I've seen this name. Well, no, I have seen this name once before, but maybe Hilarion can introduce it if he wants. He can share with us a little bit. I don't remember. I love the name, St. Hilarion. Uh, great name. I've noticed that it seems acceptable that there is a set of rules for the parish and a set of rules for the monastery. Shouldn't we behave the same at the parish as we do in our monastery when it comes to modesty and reverence? Thank you, Hilarion. Absolutely. And of course, if you talk to the monastics, they will agree that it would be very good if a parish tried to follow the same basic guidelines for piety and modesty and reverence in the holy temple. It, are the, is the temple in the parish any different than the temple, and, you know, the altar, what we're doing there, than the, the monastery? No. Of course not. It's one divine liturgy. It's all offered in heaven. We ascend there together. It's one Christ, one divine liturgy, one uh, sacrifice. And therefore, the same spiritual event is happening in every local church, excuse me, every local synaxis of the faithful. It's the same mystery, the same gathering of the church. We're all together in heaven in one place. So there cannot be a, def, a double standard. However, having said that, the reality is many parishes have people who are not struggling deeply. They've settled in. They've become kind of a secularized Orthodox reality. And there's either not teaching going on or, or the teaching's really uphill battle for the priest to change things. And so you just don't have the will a lot of times, the willpower on the part of these, pa these faithful uh, or if you can call them faithful, I don't know. It depends what we're talking about. But the, the Orthodox Christians in the parishes who are running the parishes oftentimes are not committed to, uh, you know, reverent piety and modesty in all things in the, in the temple and in the church. Or they don't understand. They don't take time to understand. They're ignorant. I mean, there's a variety of reasons why. But uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We don't have two gospels. We don't have two paths to, to the Lord. We don't. We don't have two. You know, um, like double standard. Like two standards. Hmm. And for some reason, it won't go away. I don't know. Okay. Next question. Uh, John H. Well, now it went away. Uh, what are the ways to try and be more pious within the temple? How we enter or walk or speak, or when is it appropriate to speak, uh, when it is appropriate to speak, move around, move the children, with the children. If someone speaks to us, how to react. Speaking during divine services isn't appropriate, but it is common for conversations after services in the temple, even with clergy. Is it better to be silent and come across as rude or maybe try and speak softly or move softly out? Uh, those are great, great questions, John. I appreciate the questions. I mean, there is a high standard that I can, I can give you the high standard I think we should all strive for. And then there's going to be a variety of <laughs> applications of that standard. Then there's going to be a variety of exceptions that are that are uh, that can be blessed. All right. So 
uh, we don't, they're not the norm, they're not the standard, but they, they can happen and they can be blessed. So it depends, right? Depends, like everything, it depends. But the basic high standard rule, the norm would be that you avoid conversation in church as much as possible, if, if possible entirely. Uh, you avoid a kind of, uh, you know, aimless moving around. But if you want to go venerate an icon, you haven't venerated it, you're coming in, you venerate, that's fine. If it's a pro- it's the pro- appropriate part of the service, you can go and venerate an icon um, or the icons. Certainly move around and light a candle. You can move around. That's not a problem. That's why we don't like pews in the Orthodox Church. Pews are anathema, even though, unfortunately, people have them in many churches. It's not proper. And they never had them in the history of the church. And they, they, had, they inhibit people from going and venerating and all the rest. So bad idea, but we bought into it with the Protestant uh, Mudlu. And so um, I'm answering your questions here. So we avoid conversations. Uh, we, um, if people speak to us, we should probably be very, very discreet and whisper in their ear and tell them, Maybe we can talk later, or if you have to answer them because it's something urgent, then answer them and then say, let's talk later, the rest of it. Uh, yes, these are blessed things to do, right? When you enter the temple, you either take your candles and go light them, or you light them there where you are, depending on where they light the candles. You venerate all the all the icons. You take your place, men on the right, usually women on the left, or, or uh, perhaps families or in the very back or, or whatever it is in the parish that you have the arrangement, you go get your, your spot and, and you stay there essentially. And, you know, if, if there are Stasidia in the church, they're very helpful because you can rest your arms on, uh, on them. You can also put it down and sit for a time uh, or you can sit halfway. There's a, there's a variety. Excuse me. Mm. Uh, but in any case, uh, moving around has not really ever been a huge problem as long as it's done for reverent and, uh, reverence and piety's sake. Uh, there's no problem to move around and light candles and venerate icons or or, or whatever it might be. Talking always uh, try to try to avoid it if possible. But if you do end up talking for some urgent need or something, you whisper. You don't sit and chat. Uh, after the service is done, people do some th- sometimes stay in the whole uh, the temple and talk. But again, it, there should be good reason for it. It should be done in a very pious way, uh, not just sitting around chatting right in the chapel. Or in the church. All right. Hopefully that answers the question. Hilarion. Oh, we said this already. Excuse me. Let me see if I can get. I, I say done done answering, but it doesn't go away for some reason. It's strange. I don't know. All right. This is John H. Did we already answer that? No. No, we did. For whatever reason, they're not disappearing when I answer them. They're supposed to go to the answered column, but they're not. I don't know why. This one's not even... Okay, I don't know. Uh, Let's see. Nicole of Texas. How you doing, Nicole? Archbishop Demetrius of Dallas of Thrice Blessed Memory taught us that the most elevated language in a culture should be used as a way of expressing reverence for God. Indeed. Poetry and all the rest. So the cha- second chant capitalizing, the second chant capitalizing God and Thy, or reserving Thy for the Theotokos, theologically sound, is the appropriate reverent form of address in his view. Second chant capitalizing God. Uh, okay. Whereas in your first prayer, Thy is used. I understand the Greek. Oh, I see. You're talking about the chant we're using. Well, that, that's a that's not properly done, and I have been negligent. Um, okay. Whereas in your first prayer, the I is used. I understand the Greek does not discriminate, but how wonderful that English can. How do fathers see this? Please, Father, thank you in Christ. Well, I think it is an English issue, and I usually always capitalize... Um, 
anytime Christ is referred to, uh, we capitalize. And so that's the, that's the appropriate way to talk about him. Or, you know, every time there's a him or he, it's capitalized. So, yeah, I, I would agree with that approach and that piety, that reverence. Uh, Justin, Father Bless, what are the main differences between the Evergetinos and the Yerondikon? Um, the Evergetinos is larger, more systematic, and goes by, I'm pretty sure it goes by, um, like, issue, not, I'm pretty sure, it goes by issue, it goes by theme, right? So it's like, you know, we have one section here, um, let's see if I can find it for you. Give me an example. So this is hypothesis 15, or no, 14. And it, and, it, and it tells you this this section is addressing the following, and then it goes through uh, a variety of texts that they have excerpted from. The life of St. Cinco de Key, the life of St. Pacomios, the life of St. Luke, from St. Maximus, from the Yerondicon, from St. Ephraim. So it's a larger and bigger collection from a variety of sources and it's it goes by hypothesis or you know one particular general theme that they're covering. So this one is that the ascetic struggler, even when he is physically ill, should have no desire whatsoever for pleasures or relax his discipline or place any hope of a cure in medical treatment, but in God, by whose dispensation illnesses also come to us. So that's the theme of all this commentary. And you've got one, two. Three, four, five, six, six sources that he's that they're coming from. Yorondikon is basically a collections of of one speaker, Ava Antoni, Ava Sisoyes, right? And you go uh, through the their entire. It's not by theme. It's not by topic. That's the, one of the main differences. And I think it's smaller. The Yorondikon is smaller than Ever you know, so Ever you know, includes Palestine. Other, that's pretty big. That's my understanding. But I haven't done any kind of research to tell you for sure what we're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what's got into me here with my yawning. That's terrible. Forgive me. All right. So I, it appears I've answered all four questions, even though I can't send them to the answer, um, the answer section. But I have answered all four. Let me just make sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I think so. And yes. All right. So I have answered all your questions. We're going on two hours. I could entertain a few more if, you, if you're interested. Otherwise, we can call it a night. And we'll see you on hopefully tomorrow night's live stream with Craig Trulia. And then Thursday night, question and answer. And then Friday night, if you bought the book, uh, uh, St. Jacobus of Evia, if you bought this book, then you can join me on Friday for our question and answer session, your questions about the book. You can bring your questions and we'll talk about it. Tomorrow's live stream is at 3 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Eastern. Tomorrow, pay attention, 6 o'clock Eastern, not 8 o'clock. Oh, there's more questions? No, I don't see anything. Nope, only four questions. So you, somebody has to go and copy-paste them so I can see them. There's some kind of malfunctioning. They're not disappearing either. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I answered the four that are there, even though they won't disappear. They don't disappear. So I don't see any more but the four. Excuse me. Again. Mm. Can you... Can somebody copy paste them for me? Because I don't know why I'm not seeing them here. Oh, memories? What what memories do you got there, John? You're talking about good memories? I don't know. You see them disappearing on your end. That's bizarre. Oh, really? Okay, I, I still see them in the top box. They do not disappear on me, and I don't see anything but those four. 
So if you see the if you see those questions, please take them and paste them in the comment section. All right, let's start with that one. Nancy in Alberta is pasting this. I don't know if it's your question. Is there a proper way to dispose of baptismal water? What should we do with crumbs from Antidoron? Pick them up and eat them. Place them in a place for burning. Uh, the baptismal water, of course, should be put in the Honeftiri, or the place in the holy altar where they have a sink going into the ground. That's where you put that holy water. And if you don't have that, then you create a somehow you create some place to put it in the ground, or you go in a place where there's no walking. Nobody's going to go there and step on it, and you put it there like under a tree or in a uh, plant or something where the water is not going to be walked upon. So that's the order of things for the baptismal water. Now, the crumbs of the other one you should generally pick up and eat, uh, unless for whatever reason, I don't know, it's just totally mixed with something. You cannot eat it, then you should burn it in that order. All right, next question is, towards the end of the session, St. Paisa said the Panagia is the most beautiful and solemn body. Does this mean that she has the most beautiful face and figure? I don't want to misunderstand the saint and think in a worldly way about the Panagia. Well, you know, the way you're putting it leads me to believe that maybe we're thinking in worldly terms about what beauty is. So it has to be like the, the cut of the face or, you know, the eyes, the proportion, all that kind of thing. Is that what you mean? He may mean that. He may also mean that the body of the Panagia has been totally sanctified and, and therefore whatever the structural, you know, makeup of her bones or whatever it might be that people talk about beauty and proportion and all that um, is, is overshadowed by the Beauty of the body, meaning sanctified and, and glorified. But he may also mean that no, she was actually, he actually saw the Panagia, so he probably knows, right? He actually talks about seeing the Panagia. So, and he says she looked most like the icon of the, of, from Jerusalem that's over the grave of the Panagia. The, so that's, that's interesting. I don't, we don't have too many saints who say, excuse me. Who say I saw the Panagia and, and here's how it looks like in one of the icons, but he did say that. So I don't know what to say if it's a structural, you know, beauty as well, external. But I, I maybe. What do you guys understand? It is not specific, so I don't know. Is there a proper way? Uh, let's see. We said that. I think we already did that. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I should go to Telegram then and look at Telegram. I can do that. Ooh. Is that your Telegram I'm going to? Okay. I see that now. Interesting. Let me uh, put this aside for a minute and then bring it back up. All right. One thing I do with small children, two years old and 10 months old, is never let them eat in the nave, but rather to eat in the narthex. Is eating in the narthex good or should we go outside where we can't hear the prayers and such? Depends what we're talking about. If we're eating the holy things that have been blessed, that happens in the narthex, like koliva, that's fine. Obviously, if we're eating food, we shouldn't eat any food in the narthex or the nave. If we're talking about like food that you bring with them or food, I don't think it's appropriate to sit and for them to munch on a whatever, I don't know, bread or sandwich or whatever it is that because they're small kids, I think it would be best if they walked out. You're, you're you're teaching something in that way. You're teaching something that's probably not a good idea. Like, a, like, yeah. Only the holy things that have been blessed, I would say, are blessed to eat in the narthex. That's just me, though. I mean, there's no, I don't have any rule, but that would be consistent with the piety that I'm seeing. Many people in my parish cross themselves where the narthex ends and nave begins. 
I prefer to cross myself at the church doors because the narthex is still part of the holy temple. Anything wrong with crossing oneself at the edge of the nave and not at the doors? No, I don't think there's any problem. You can cross yourself then and then. And I don't think there's going to be any major issue there. Um, just don't do it to stand out. You know, like, don't do it like in a proud way. Like, hey, look at me. I'm crossing myself or something. That would be a bad idea. Many people in my parish cross themselves. Okay, we just did that. Uh, your blessing, Father, I know it is immodest to look at people in the eyes. Where should we look when talking to people while also making sure that we express that we are paying attention to what the other person is saying? Thank you, Father. Well, in my experience, what it's worth, um, we do want to have eye contact. That shows that you're paying attention to what they're saying, but not continual, intense eye contact. Often and all, and occasionally you're you're diverting your gaze and you're thinking and you're looking and you're considering, but generally you want to pay attention to what they're saying. I don't think that's a problem. I've never heard anybody say that's a problem in Orthodox piety or something. So um, if that's if I understand you right, yeah. If you're talking about um, in the context of the church, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm not understanding you. Hopefully that's answered. Let me know. Your blessing, Father, I know it is immodest to look at people. Oh, we just said that. Is there a proper way to dispose? Oh, we just did that too. So there's a, some repetition here. Let me see. Yep, did those two. How about this one? Father Bless, do you have any resources for an, an altar server? I go to a mission parish, and my priest wanted me to help him out behind the altar despite being Orthodox for only a year now. I listen to my priest's instruction, but I want to make sure I'm doing things correctly while I'm serving. Uh, thank you. Okay, Jacob. Um, generally, what can I say about your serving? What we talked about tonight, good order, humility, prayer, constantly. Uh, if you do that, you should be fine. You should dress properly in church, uh, you know, formally. Um, I don't know if that means absolutely you have to have a tie, but you have to have a, you know, basically a, a dress suit or dress clothing. Um, There you go. John gives, uh, uh, there you go. There's an altar server's guide. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, John. So that should help you out. All right. Let's see what else we got. Is this it? No, we got that. We got that. All right. I think I cut, I think I Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Let's see now. That's not the one I want. <sighs> Patron group. Where am I? Where am I going for this? Is there more? I don't know where to go. I'm done with that. Okay, Justin or John or, or, or um, Timothy, where am I looking for the next questions? Or is that it? Let me know. I don't know where to go. I thought I, I answered them all in your chat, right? I don't know. I don't see anything else in Telegram. What am I missing? Okay, Justin is typing. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Yeah, no. All right, I don't see any other questions. What am I missing? Am I missing questions still? One, two, three, four. I only see four questions. Let's see what you got. 
That should be all. Okay. All righty. Well, there you go. Let me remind everybody that we have a big book launch coming up at the end of the month. So get ready and help and support what we're doing. Um, I'm excited that that book back there in the middle, can you see that? I get out. Can you see that? Of course, we have the XMO Guitarian out. If you don't have the XMO Guitarian, you're going to want to get that. This big book is coming out in just a couple of days. You've been seeing, you're going to see a ton of material coming out supporting this and promoting this, right? You've seen this promoted here. That's going to be out in about two weeks' time. We're going to have book reviews. We're going to have promotional material. We're going to have a big offer for everybody who wants to buy it, a big discount. And we want everybody who's supporting our work to support this book launch. Think about how you can do that. How can you spread the word? How can you help us help people uh, find the book? How can you help people order the book? How can you get your parish to order it for their bookstore? We need a team effort. This is a really important book for the church, I think, in America. And we're doing everything we can to make it a big uh, an important uh, book launch. So help us out. That's two weeks from yesterday. Uh, we're also coming out uh, with uh, Concerning Frequent Communion again. That'll be back in circulation soon. And we have another big book launch, the next one in September, uh, a very important book on Catholicism, and many more to come. We got uh, tomorrow night, you're going to learn about another book that we're publishing in the near future. So we'll see you, uh, God willing, tomorrow night. Again, that's at 6 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, American time. We're going to be looking, again, let me put it on the screen, everybody, so that you can join us. We're looking at this whole question of the Roman Catholic Orthodox dialogue, this tendency to have a postmodernist epistemology or gnosiology, and that is how do we know what we know? On what basis do we know the truth and, and how can we understand the truth of things? And we're looking at the contemporary dialogue and how uh, that's been affected by the trends of today and how that's not going to lead to a true union in Christ tomorrow night, uh, 6 p.m., 3 p.m. Pacific. And then we're back, question and answer on Thursday and our question and answer session for St. Jacobus on Friday right here in Crowdcast. God bless you. Good to see you again. Uh, we'll put the uh, Jesus prayer on by our great uh, elder um, Paisios, and then we'll go. We'll, we'll, we'll do that for a few minutes, and then we'll head out. See you tomorrow. God bless. Thanks for joining us. Kyrie Jesus Christ, Elei Sonne. 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 Υπεραγγεία Θεοτόκη. Κύριε Ιησού Χριστέ, ελέη σώνε. 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 Κύριε Ιησού Χριστέ, Ελέη Σόνε. 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 Υπεραγγεία Θεοτόκη, Jesus, my